It's time to go on the record with WRAL News. How North Carolina elections are conducted, women's reproductive health care options, funding for our state's public schools. These are all issues the North Carolina Supreme Court could consider in the years to come. And the political makeup of that court is on the ballot in November. Tonight, I'll interview the four candidates running for two seats on the state's highest court. Thanks so much for joining us, joining us for our ongoing midterm elections coverage for On the Record. I'm Lena Tillette. First up tonight, the two candidates facing off in the race to replace outgoing state Supreme Court Justice Robin Hudson, a Democrat. Democrat. Judge Lucy Inman is a judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals, where she has served since 2015. Her professional career began as a newspaper reporter, which inspired her to work within the judicial system. She then spent 18 years in civil litigation. She's running as a Democrat. Judge Richard Dietz is also a judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals, where he has served since 2014. As a lawyer, Dietz argued cases before the U.S. Supreme Court court. He's running as a Republican. Judge Inman, Judge Dietz, thank you both so much for joining me. You know, you both have said one of the reasons you're running is to protect the courts from partisanship. Do you think judicial elections should be partisan at all? Should we know that you're a registered Democrat and that you're a registered Republican? Beginning with you, Judge Dietz. Yeah, so what I, what I hear from voters that uh, I've never met a voter who said, I want partisan judges. So they want nonpartisan judicial elections. And I, but I think what they're getting at there is we just want judges out of politics altogether. Um, we want to hear about the work judges do, help us understand the court system, help us understand what it is that judges do, and help us with the problems that we have in the court system. And I think that's the key, is for us to be able to get our message out of, you know, what is our plan, what is the leadership that we'll bring um, to our state's highest court. And I think that's what voters want to know. And so it really doesn't have anything to do with politics. Um, it's about our message for we, how we can help people. Would you prefer then not to say that you're a registered Republican? I just think the party labels don't say anything about what it is that we do. Mm -hmm. So I'm not worried about uh, having the labels on there or not having them on there. I'm worried about can I convince voters that I'm going to help their lives, I'm going to help the court system. And I think that's what inspires people to say, I believe in this judge, I want to vote for them. Judge Inman? Um, I uh, was elected in 2014 in a nonpartisan election, so I've won, run statewide under that system. And for a myriad of reasons, I believe that nonpartisan elections are far better for the integrity of our judiciary. Um, as an example, the North Carolina Bar Association, every time there's a judici statewide judicial election, um, has had a forum with the candidates, sort of like we are here today. And this year, for the first time that I can remember, the Bar Association didn't have a candidate forum. Instead, they had a three-part symposium on the independence of the judiciary. And in that symposium, they presented a poll of non-lawyers and lawyers, mm -hmm. and the poll found that 71% of non-lawyers preferred nonpartisan judicial elections to partisan, and 75% of lawyers. We've also seen more turnover on our state's appellate courts in the last several years since these elections were reverted from nonpartisan to partisan. Mm. And um, but as Judge Deet said, we're running under the system we have. We have to be labeled as partisans. I want people to know I'm a person, not a partisan. Judge Inman, you know, before an election, judges will say that they are limited in what they can say about a particular issue because they may need to rule on it. Why is that so frowned upon under judicial norms? You know, this is an election. Voters care about issues. They care deeply about issues. Why shouldn't they know where you stand on those issues? Well, that's a question I get asked all the time, and I bet Judge Dietz does as well. Um, but it's so important to remember that the judiciary, unlike the legislature, unlike the governor, we are the one branch of government that must remain neutral. We must be fair and impartial. And if a judge expresses his or her opinion about a legal issue that's heading to the court, that is going to give everyone an impression that that judge has already made up his or her mind. I know it seems frustrating, but I think it's, it's um, sort of the cost that we have of making sure the public has confidence in our judiciary to be fair and impartial. Hmm. Judge Dietz? 
Yeah, I agree. I think um, one of the wonderful things about lawyers and judges is we're trained to be able to see all sides of an issue. When you're a lawyer, you're representing your client, um, you're seeing what their issues are. It may not be that you personally agree with your client, um, but you're going to advocate for them. And as judges, what we're doing is being able to see all of those perspectives that are coming from the different sides and then looking and seeing, you know, we're weighing them and saying, what is the right result here? And I think in order to do that, we need to give the public confidence that we can do that job of seeing all sides. And I think judges who go out there and talk a lot about their personal views, that can undermine this idea um, that judges set all that aside. And that is what we do. Um, you know, you put on the robe and you put aside your personal preferences and say, uh, I follow the law, and that means it doesn't matter what I think anymore. What matters is what does the law say, and how do we reassure people that we are impartial? Can you provide an example where you persuaded judges on the Court of Appeals or where you were persuaded by judges um, on a specific judicial conclusion reached? I think uh, what voters want to know is how flexible you are in your thinking and how persuasive you could be on the court. Sure. So one thing is we can't talk about the specifics of what we as judges um, on a court of appeals or the Supreme Court are doing when we're meeting about the case. But I can give you a great example. So one thing um, that many of your viewers are probably familiar with is the idea of dissent. So sometimes you'll have judges who, and there'll be a majority opinion, then other judges disagree and write a dissent. So in eight years as a court of appeals judge, I'm the only judge who's never written a dissent. And the reason is because I really believe in this idea of collaboration and consensus building. So I work hard with my colleagues and say, let's think about all these issues. If we disagree, let's work through it. Let's figure out um, how can we come together? Because I think when we come together as a court and agree, um, the public, when they see that, they have more confidence um, in the rule of law that way. And so I'm proud of the fact that I've been a consensus builder on the court, working hard to get us all to agree. Judge um, Well. I would say that um, um, unlike Judge Dietz, I have written some dissents, and um, generally speaking, judges and justices write many dissents that never see the light of day because their colleagues may agree with them or they may agree with their colleagues. And I think finding common ground is so very important. But if I have exhausted all efforts and I have great respect for my colleagues, um, if we have exhausted all of our efforts at collaborating, and I believe that the majority of the panel that I'm serving on is misstating the law, is breaking from precedent without a good reason, it is my duty to stand up for what is right and to write a dissent. I haven't written very many. I'm sure um, on the scale of the number of dissents I've written compared to other judges, it's quite few. But a couple of times that I have written dissents, the North Carolina Supreme Court has reversed the majority for the reasons stated in my dissent. So I think it's important to be able to stand up for what you believe in while respectfully working with your colleagues. Well, let's talk about some of the criticism that the state's highest court has received in recent years. Some critics have called out judges for so-called legislating from the bench. We hear that a lot. And I want to dig deeper into what that means exactly, because you know, when the text of the law is vague or someone sees maybe a conflict between the law and the state constitution, aren't the courts there to resolve that issue? Where is the line for you, Judge Inman? Well, that is a, that is a, a question that a lot of people ask. And legislating from the bench is a reference to judges going beyond what their authority is as a court and instead making policy and changing the law like the legislature. Um, but that is in the eye of the beholder, if you will. One person's legislating from the bench may be another person's analysis. Um, my philosophy is that we apply the text of the statutes as they've been written by our legislature. And if the text is unambiguous, that's the law we must follow. You won't be surprised to know that occasionally there's text written by the legislature that one judge will say is absolutely clear to mean A, and another judge will say is absolutely clear to mean B. And what do they do? We, we go to the fundamental principles of canons of interpretation. Mm -hmm. And this is, if you think about it like scientific methodology, if we're all following the same rule book, the same rule of law, we may disagree. 
Um, at the end of the day, my philosophy is to do what your middle school math teacher told you, and that is show your work. If you, can exp if you present the facts honestly and the law honestly, and you explain how you've reached a conclusion, other courts and the public can judge whether they think you're legislating from the bench. Judge Dietz, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Yeah, I think um, I've been a court of appeals judge for eight years. Um, in that time, I've seen a lot of laws that are passed by our General Assembly. And there have been times when I've looked and said, boy, I don't know why this law is written this way. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It seems like what they might have been trying to accomplish here, it's not going to get done the way they wrote this law. But I think our job as judges is to say, but this is what the law says. Because I really don't know what's going on behind the scenes um, with lawmakers. Maybe there was an agreement to write it this way in order to get the votes for it to be passed, for example. That's democracy. That's um, our democratic process. And so what I think legislating from the bench when people say that, it's the idea that judges are maybe saying, but you know, I know more than those folks about lawmaking, so I'm going to step in here and rewrite the law. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's wrong. Our role of judges is to say, this is what the law says, and um, we'll follow it. Judge Dietz, Judge Inman, thank you both so much for your time and for your insight. I hope people learned a lot about you tonight. Coming up, we're back with the two other candidates facing off, hoping to earn your vote. Welcome back. Tonight's election special is all about the two state Supreme Court races on the ballot in November. We just heard from the two opponents in one race, and now we're going to hear from the other two. Associate Justice Sam Irvin IV is running to keep his seat on the North Carolina Supreme Court, where he has served since 2015. Before joining the state Supreme Court, Irvin was a judge on the Court of Appeals and a member of North Carolina's Utilities Commission, Irvin is a Democrat. Trey Allen began his legal career as a judge advocate in the U.S. Marine Corps. He then went on to clerk under Republican State Supreme Court Justice Paul Newby. Allen was recently appointed general counsel for the NC Administrative Office of the Courts. Allen is a Republican. Thank you both for joining me this evening. Justice Irvin, I'll begin with you because you both are obviously running in this statewide election. Do you think that North Carolina should elect judges at all, or should this be done through appointment, a nomination process, some other form? I mean, I, the conclusion I've come to after thinking about that question for a lot over a long period of time is the Constitution of this state provides that judges are to be elected. That's been the case since 1868. I see no indication that there is any public sentiment for changing the method of appointment of, of selection of judges. There periodically are proposals to do that, but they've never gotten very far. And so I don't know that it really matters what any of us think about what the system ought to be. I think what we try to do in having judicial selection systems is to balance the need for accountability on the one hand and independence on the other. There are a number of different ways that you can select judges. They fall in different places on that continuum. Uh, and, and after, as I said, thinking about it a lot, I think different things on different days. The advantage of, of uh, the uh, election system can be that there are folks who can get elected but not appointed who would be good judges. The potential problem with an elective system that may be cured by an appointed system is that you wind up with a risk in an election system that Folks may get elected that you know don't have the qualifications necessary to be a uh, a judge, and so I'm kind of betwixt and between on the answer to that question. But I don't think it really matters what I think because it's going to be elections. That's just the way it's, it's been and the way it will be, in my opinion. Mr. Allen. So North Carolina actually has a history with appointed judges uh, under our first state constitution, which was uh, adopted in 1776. Uh, the legislature appointed all of our, our judges. Um, there are places uh, like, for example, Great Britain, uh, where they have a, a non, an apolitical system for selecting their judges. Um, the reason that I think it, that'd be a hard sell here um, is because of the power of judicial review. Uh, judges have the ability under our system to strike down laws uh, that they deem to be inconsistent with our state constitution or our federal constitution. And because of that, I think there needs to be some accountability. Uh, there, there needs to be a point at which uh, they're answerable to, to some authority other than themselves. And uh, judicial elections uh, give us that accountability. You know, Mr. Allen, a lot of voters want to know what even rises to the level 
of it being a state Supreme Court case, what would go into your decision to take a case at that level as opposed to allowing it to be resolved at the Court of Appeals level? Well, there's, a, there's actually statutory criteria that uh, Supreme Court justices are opposed to, or excuse me, are supposed to apply when they're deciding whether to, to hear a case. Um, and the, the criteria include whether it's a, an, a, an important legal issue, whether it's an issue that uh, involves the North Carolina Constitution. Uh, if, it, if it fits those categories, then the court uh, should take the case and, and in ordinary circumstances uh, should uh, resolve the case. The court also takes cases um, in which there has been a dissent in the Court of Appeals. And, and mm -hmm. if you're a party to a case in which there's been a dissent, you have a right to appeal to the North Carolina Supreme Court. Justice Irvin, how would you respond to that? And, and I would say that our jurisdiction at the court really is split into two categories. As Mr. Allen said, there are a certain number of types of cases that we have to take. Cases in which the defendant has been convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to death automatically come to the Supreme Court. Cases that arise in general rate cases from the Utilities Commission that, as you mentioned, I served on directly come to the Supreme Court. We have an institution in this state called the Business Court. That court deals with complex business cases. Their appeals come directly to our court. Finally, as Mr. Allen said, if the Court of Appeals decides a case and the court is not unanimous, that one member of the panel dissents, the party that did not prevail before the Court of Appeals has the chance to automatically obtain Supreme Court review. With respect to the other approximately half to 60 percent of our docket, we choose whether to take those cases from the Court of Appeals. As, as Mr. Allen said, there is a statute that provides first that uh, we're supposed to take cases that have substantial public importance, that they're major issues for the state. Secondly, it, we take cases that have significant legal issues. And thirdly, there's a, a provision in the statute that says that if the Court of Appeals has failed to follow up Supreme Court precedent, we have the right to take that case. Hmm. It's a discretionary decision. It's one of the most important we make, but that's the criteria that are used. You're obviously the lone candidate uh, that I've talked to tonight who's actually a sitting justice, so you have insight on what's happening on the court right now. I know that there are some things that you can talk about and some things mm -hmm. you can't, but, right. but why do you think the court recently has issued so many four to three rulings and is there any effort happening to try to to bring on conservatives to the majority opinion what is that process like well I don't know what exactly what you mean by the last part of that question uh, the court has certainly had more split decisions in the last several years that comes from a number of factors at least in my opinion and you're correct I cannot talk about any specific case because the code of judicial conduct prohibits me from doing that under certain circumstances the cases that we decide are very difficult cases we're there to solve the most difficult legal issues that arise in the state and so it's not surprising occasionally that people will disagree I have probably written more majority opinions for the court than any other member of the court that's sitting on it now uh, I try very hard to come up with decisions that uh, attract votes from all members of the court. I've written a number of them that threaded the needle between very different positions and obtained un unanimity. And I try personally very hard to do that. I also think that my record shows that I look at each case individually and vote my own belief as to what the law is regardless of who I may be aligned with at any particular time. It's a, it's, it is a matter that takes work. The purpose of having a seven-member court is to have collegial decisions, and we try very hard to do that, but sometimes you can't. Okay, and just to clarify the second part of my question, what effort goes into trying to bring people together on a decision? Well, what you, what you do, the process of writing an opinion involves the circulation of the opinion. Mm -hmm. Before that, there's been a discussion of the case. Frequently, people can change their minds in the course of listening to the discussion. Uh, we pass drafts around. We talk about the case more. There's substantial effort made to get people of different perspectives to join opinions. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Mr. Allen, uh, why should the public have confidence that you wouldn't rule in lockstep with fellow conservatives, given you previously worked for uh, Justice Newby and have compared your judicial philosophy to Antonin Scalia and uh, Clarence Thomas, obviously conservatives on the U.S. Supreme Court, how can voters know that you wouldn't vote in lockstep with conservatives? Well, uh, one of the things that uh, I've done in my career is uh, 
I've been a faculty member at the UNC School of Government. I've been on the faculty there since 2013. And in fact, I'm still a faculty member there. I'm a tenured professor there. Um, I'm on leave right now serving as the general counsel for our court system. Um, and I've uh, written a, and published a large body of, of scholarly work on North Carolina law, various aspects of North Carolina law. It's publicly available. Um, some of it deals with certain controversial issues, such as a, a blog post that I wrote touching on uh, some of the governor's powers uh, under the state of emergency. I think if people look at that scholarly work, uh, they'll see that there's, there's no partisan uh, slant on that. What, what they'll find is the, the work of someone who's carefully trying to uh, understand and explain the law in, in, in an honest way. And that's the approach that, that I would take uh, as a member of the North Carolina Supreme Court. Um, the reason that uh, judicial philosophy is important, uh, and, and this does go to the, I think, to some of the splits in the court, uh, judicial philosophy is how you approach cases. Uh, and, and it's especially important at the North Carolina Supreme Court, which is what we call a, a court of last resort. On matters of state law, there's no appeal. So if the North Carolina Supreme Court gets it wrong, that's it, we're, we're, we're stuck. Plainly, how would you describe your judicial philosophy, and briefly as well? Sure. So I think judges uh, should follow the Constitution uh, as it was understood at the time of ratification, and that when it comes to interpreting statutes, um, they should uh, implement the intent uh, of the legislature as evidenced by the text of the, of, of the statute. Uh, anything else, I think, is, is judges legislating uh, from the bench. Yeah. Uh, what you, in, the job of a judge is to rule according to the law and understand that the judge, just like everybody else, is under the law, not, not above the law. And so if we turn the Constitution into nothing more than what judges say it is, um, then that is inconsistent with the idea that the rule of law applies to everybody, judges included. 30 seconds for yours. Well, in, in my response to the series of questions that you ask is, first of all, People can look at my record and they can see cases in which I voted in ways that people would not expect if they looked solely on the basis of my political affiliation. I've got a long record of doing that. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Secondly, my judicial philosophy is pretty simple. You're supposed to follow the law. Judges should not have political uh, agendas. Politics has no place in the making of a judicial decision and I think my record shows that I call them like I see them based on the law and nothing else. Justice Irvin, Mr. Allen, thank you both for your time. Good thank luck. You. Thank you. We'll be right back. A special thank you again to all of the candidates for joining me in studio for this conversation. A reminder, Election Day is November 8th, and WRAL is your headquarters for everything you need to know about the races and the candidates. The WRAL Voter Guide is up and ready for you right now on WRAL.com and our news app. There you can find your voting and early voting locations, see sample ballots, and read more about other candidates in other races. And if you have something to say about today's Tonight's discussion, please find me on social media. I'm everywhere, Facebook and Twitter at WRAL Lena Tillette, or email us on the record at WRAL.com. Have a great weekend.